Thank you, choir. So here we are. It's the Gospel of Mark. Every year, Discovery studies a different gospel. One of the four, we have a rotation. And 2023 is the Gospel of Mark. And you might have wondered, well, where was Mark back in December? Or, you know, here we are, Mark 1, verses 1 through 11, and did I miss something? So Mark, very interesting gospel. In Mark, there is no manger to start off the story. There are no wise men. There are no shepherds. Mark's nativity scene, if you're going to talk about the beginning of good news, has a different set of characters. And who's the first one? If you're going to make a little gospel of Mark nativity scene, who's the first person that appears? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Fully grown. And then the other characters that appear are all the people. And Mark makes a big deal out of all the people from the countryside. So the rural areas of Judea, all the people from across this big region come out to John, along with people from the big city of Jerusalem. They're all coming out to John in the Jordan. So those are other characters in John's nativity set. And then the final character is Jesus. Jesus. Is he a baby? No, he's fully grown. Jesus today might have looked a little on the younger side uh, in Time for Discovery. But in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is fully grown. And he comes out to the Jordan River to be baptized. So what is the deal with this thing called baptism? So A lot of times when the topic comes up, and particularly a story like this one, you might say, baptism. Well, how come we Presbyterians and other Protestants and other um, Catholics, how come we baptize babies? And in this story, they're baptizing adults. Well, let's just say baptism is a huge topic. And while baptism makes a big splash in every single gospel. Um, Baptism goes on to be a part of the book of Acts where households are baptized, and baptism takes, uh, it gets a huge foothold in the whole Christian tradition. So it's a, a gigantic topic. So today, baptism is just one part of understanding um, what, what the whole of baptism is all about. Today, the angle on baptism is that baptism seems to be a vehicle for the repentance of sins. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance. And all the people came out to John confessing their sins. So baptism is associated with really loaded topics repentance, confession, and sin that leads to forgiveness. Well, every time the word repentance comes up, I feel like I need to put a big pause on it and say, what do we mean by repentance? Because in my experience, when the topic of repentance comes up, um, in my experience, it's people who are humble who think they need to do more of repentance, and people who are more haughty, maybe could use a little repentance, aren't doing repentance. And then there's judgmentalism. Oh, you need to repent, which unfortunately is part of Christian baggage. Uh, So judgmental, uh, you know, so where do you go? with repentance, because it seems like it's a really popular, joyful, wonderful thing in the Gospel of Mark and indeed in all the Gospels. So like, what's up with repentance and confessing and forgiveness that is so popular? It just seems like so much more is going on there at the beginning of Mark. It's just this big phenomenon. 
Well, this week, I was thinking over um, something that I'll call today, um, I'll call it responsible darkness. Responsible darkness. So what do I mean by that? Let's start with darkness. And uh, the topic of darkness today, I think, connects to what we were talking about last week in Psalm 90. In Psalm 90, we talked about there is no cure for being human. So darkness. All humans and in the world, you know, there is darkness. There is a hole in our souls. There is brokenness. And I'm going to throw out one of those other big words, sin. So, again, these are words that often take us to a, a dark, despairing place. Oh, Sarah, you're going to tell me that humans uh, have darkness in them, there's a hole in our soul, we are broken, we have sin. Ugh, really? Do you have to, do you have to go there? I think it is a form of sobriety to say, in truth, to say with wisdom, there's no cure for being human, all have sinned and fallen short of the grace of God, as, it, as Paul writes in Romans. So given this darkness is part of within our lives and outside our lives, what do you do about it? Okay, so you could despair. You could ignore it. You could just not know that it's a thing, that it's just an unlabeled thing in your mind. You could blame others for the darkness. You could have responsibility for your darkness. You could take responsibility for your darkness. Well, the next place to go as reformed thinkers, does that sound like works righteousness? Like, I'm going to take responsibility for my darkness. So we've got to be careful of that. We, we don't do the hard work. God's already done the hard work of grace and love, but yet there is a piece of human participation. And that, I think, is where John and the baptism story is going. There is a piece of human participation. To pick up on a theme from our Advent, Christmas, Epiphany season, we talked about it's a gift. The whole thing is a gift. We've been given a gift, but we humans are also given the freedom and the opportunity and the option to unwrap the gift. How do we unwrap the gift? And I think the phrase I'll use this week is, being responsible with our darkness. We have an option. We have a freedom to face our darkness and face it with grace. There's a way we can turn, which is at the root of the word repent. We can turn, we can confess, and we turn to a loving and merciful God. We have that option. And John points to this vehicle for easing our burdens. And I think it's the vehicle of religion. Religion is a gift. But how many of us, you know, don't ride the vehicle? Religion is an airplane. And it's not an airplane. It, it's not something that's, you know, way back in the past. And we have to go back to the past. Religion, good religion is a, a vehicle to help us fly. And John is showing us how to fly. And a step to fly, part of the preparation, is this word of repenting, turning, confessing, which I know have so much baggage. But as reformed thinkers, we're called to, to talk about that some more because that is how we prepare ourselves for new life and how we are responsible with all the gifts that we've been given, how we 
are part of just the, the little human freedom we have to live our lives differently. So responsible darkness is the realization that, okay, I have darkness and I have options for how this is processed, how I deal with the darkness, the big how of, of processing it with grace. So the repenting, the confessing, it's not on our own and we're not working harder. We just know and we trust and the Spirit gives us this inspiration that we can turn to a loving, healing, merciful God who is all about us. And when we do that, we have this sense of forgiveness. Oh, this burden of darkness that I have talked about it last week, whether it's existential anxiety or fear, not knowing our call or purpose or being overwhelmed. When we turn to God, we get this next gift of mercy and love and hope. Some people, when they look at the story of Mark, wonder, well, why did Jesus have to be baptized? And some other gospels uh, kind of... Um, blur whether or not Jesus really did get baptized, because it's like, well, Jesus is without sin, so why would Jesus need to be baptized? So it's interesting to look uh, at the four different gospel accounts. And what I'd observe in Mark is that Jesus, yes, was baptized. It's very clear that Jesus is baptizing. And so, you know, we've so shrunk the idea of repentance and confessing. Jesus was human, and this thing of repentance, this thing of confession, prepares us. At the beginning of Mark, it says, it's quoting Isaiah, and it says, there was a voice in the wilderness who said, who is a preparer? And this voice in the wilderness was preparing people for the Lord. And then it goes on to what John was doing. John is seen as this preparer, this preparer, this preparer, this preparer of the people, and this preparer of Jesus. Jesus knew that whatever repentance and confessing is, it's a preparation for something. And what is that? We heard it right at the end of the text, verse 11. It's preparation to be in deeper relationship with God. At the end of Jesus' baptism, the heavens are torn apart, the spirit descends like the dove, and a voice is heard, you are my son, my beloved, I am so delighted in you. Couldn't be happier. Couldn't be happier. That is pure joy. So this repentance, confess, whatever that is, it is a pathway. This taking responsibility or making the choice of saying, no cure for it, but I can turn to one greater than I am, more compassionate, more wise, um, mysterious, and yet full of love. I can turn there, and in that turn, I get this um, understanding and closeness to God. I think it's not just for Jesus, it's for all of us. That voice models, you are my kid, I love you. I am so delighted in you. That is the baptismal gift for all of us. And it's not baptism, it's a form of repentance that we can do every day, the turn. It's a process, it's a gift, we can turn and um, deepen our relationship. And that is a prayer I have for all of us, you know, across 2023, anytime. That turn and that gift of deeper, that's the point, deeper relationship with God that prepares us for life. And then the second thing that happens, Jesus and we are prepared for our journey. The next thing Jesus does is he, he breaks out and he does his huge ministry on earth, but he doesn't do it right away. He turns, he receives God's grace, God's strength. One thing that I've been thinking about the last three months is a prayer for myself or a prayer for others 
that may you have the spirituality and the psychology commensurate with your call. So we all have calls in the world, and we, God doesn't want us to just do them cold. God gives us the gifts of spirituality and psychology to, uh, that is equivalent or abundant to face the stuff that we are called to do in the world. So responsible darkness. You know, a call for all of us to be responsible with our darkness. I think it's tied to the reform concept called joyful obedience. Obedience is one of those words, not very popular. But there is a way. There is a way forward with darkness. We have options. And, you know, if I'm going to talk about responsible darkness, I'm going to sound judgmental for a moment. There's irresponsible darkness. And what does irresponsible darkness look like? It's not uh, taking responsibility for your darkness. It's not, it's blaming somebody else. It could be just ignorance about what religion is, what the tools are. And it's not like we all get it. So I think the way that we get it is each of us individually grapple with responsible darkness, our own spirituality, our own journey. You know, it's a daily thing, and I, I hope at church there's a support group that here that keeps us real about the sobriety of being human and the joy of the turn to God and um, how God prepares us for whatever's on our plate. It is an absolutely true thing. I was wondering if in our times, does this message really hold? You know, does, is this helpful? And I thought, you know, I think it really is true. This simple, simple thing. It, it's really real that the turn, um, the trust, the listening, the being healed, and then the having a deeper relationship and being better prepared for our work in the world. I think my prayer is, how do we as discovery um, find the language for it, practice it, that we are kind of like John the Baptist in our times, that we model. There is joy, but it takes some work. You know, we are not enablers. We are not babies. We are disciples. And that's the path that we are on. Becoming more, um, you know, embracing our discipleship. And we're going to explore that more deeply every single week in the Gospel of Mark. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.